The Sea-Doo XP models were some of, if not, the most iconic Sea-Doo's ever made. So what happened to the iconic XP? Well, stick around because today in this video, I'm gonna do a deep dive into this iconic XP and its history. So what happened to the Sea-Doo XP? If I'm completely honest, I'm not 100% sure. The Sea-Doo history is absolutely immense. Anyone that knows anything about Sea-Doo's or was there in the 90s will tell you the XP is like, is God. And that's no exaggeration. The XP ran from 1991 all the way through to 2004. It was absolutely dominant in the race series, sold absolutely thousands of this unit. And then in 2004, it just vanished into the archive of Sea-Doo. Now I have some logics as to why. I'm gonna cover that at the back end of this video, but it's only fitting to set the scene as to why it's such an iconic ski. It's to take you quickly, and I say quickly, probably won't be quickly, down a little bit of the history of Sea-Doo. Now I'm gonna try and cover everything in as much detail as I can, and there will inevitably be bits that I miss out because there is so many intricacies to this. The bits that I miss, all of you guys, that's your job to stick it in the comments so anything that I'm missing, or maybe I've got slightly wrong, hopefully I don't get anything wrong, you can cover me off. So the XP was first introduced in 1991 and it ran all the way through to 2004. And throughout those years, it changed quite a lot, but there are technically three generations. If you wanna get really nerdy, some people say four generations, but if you actually look in terms of aesthetic generations, we've got the 91, 92 Gen 1, we've got the 1993 through to 1996 Generation 2, and 1997 through to 2004, which was the final and third generation. Now that fourth generation that I referenced, some people claim the 93 and 94 XP because it didn't technically have the X4 hole was the generation two. But for all intents and purposes, if you look at the top deck design, it looks like a generation two. So I'm gonna classify it as three generations, put in the comments what you guys think. The reason why there is quite a lot of confusion around the generations is every year, something typically changed, whether it was an engine modification, the decals and colorways most certainly always change year on year and features do upgrade but fundamentally if you were to look at each of the generations they do chassis wise or top deck wise look relatively similar if you actually tune into the specific generation you're looking at if you take the 1993 to 1996 xp that top deck design with those flowing mirrors which was quite revolutionary for the time is that sort of staple look so whether you're looking at a 1993 all the way through to the 1996 you are kind of looking at the same top deck design. It then just comes down to the differences with the actual hole, i.e. the 93 and 94 didn't feature that X4 hole and the 95, 96 did, plus the engine obviously updated throughout those years from the likes of the 717 through to the iconic 787-800. For context, something that's gonna be important throughout this video, Sea-Doo had a habit in the 90s of essentially taking their older models once a new model came in, and they would rebadge it a lot of the time to an SPX to sort of keep the longevity of that model for further years beyond its lifespan, if you like. A good example of this is in 96, when the iconic XP800 transferred in 97, to the Parabolic V, third generation design. They essentially took the XP800 design, the top deck design and the X4 hole, which everyone loved, and the engine, the RAV valve engine, and they rebadged it as the SPX. Now the SPX ran from 97 all the way through to 99. So if you want an X4 hole and you're not bothered about the XP badging, then check out the SPXs because they are ultimately a rebadged, a reskinned version of the X4. Me personally, I absolutely love the 1999 SPX because it brought back the hump seat from the iconic 95 XP, which I'll touch on in a sec. And it obviously features all those years of incremental improvement over the original X4s. The SPX holds a lot of nostalgia for many, but it is ultimately not technically an XP, although it uses the X4 sort of whole engine it's obviously not got quite the same level of iconic prominence, if you like, as that XP. So let's go through this in chronological order to give you a top level. And I'm gonna try not to go too crazy into the detail because this video could be sort of two hours long, which 
put in the comments if you want a much, much longer format video, I'm happy to do that. So generation one XP was in 1991 and 1992. Now to set the scene and give you context here, what came before that was the Sea-Doo SP. Now the Sea-Doo SP for its time was obviously a revolutionary ski, but it did have features and elements to do with it that were lacking that they looked to rectify in the 1991 XP. The XP featured an all new dual carburetor setup, which was marketed at the time as twin carb. It featured a 580cc road tax engine and something that they also marketed a tuned exhaust, therefore allowing the XP to boast an increased horsepower of 56 horsepower versus the single carb SP only offered 50 miles per hour, which gave the XP a slightly higher 45 miles per hour top speed now to give you context guys, that's only five miles an hour for that 56 horsepower engine than the current day sea Spark 90 horsepower. The XP used a very similar top deck design to the previous SP model. However, it featured new improved details, which were quite a big deal at the time, with things like a new grab handle, which made reboarding in deeper water much easier. Nice integrated flow and mirrors within the top hood. And for the first time, we were seeing things like fuel gauges, rev counters, low oil warnings, all of which would have been a big deal because at that time, the SP didn't have any of these features. Under the seat, although it was a dual carburetor setup, it used the same yellow engine block that was in the SP which was actually then upgraded in 1992, which I'll touch on in a sec, to the more reliable white engine block. So when the 1991 XP came in with those striking neon green and purple colors, it was kind of like a game changer. And Sidu did actually play on that within their marketing for the time with really, really pushing this revolutionary theme. So in 1992, not a lot changed in all honesty. The colorway stayed the same with the XP, but we actually saw a manual VTS be added. Most notably, if you look on the side, left-hand side, I believe it is, of the XP, in 92, you see a purple dial, which is for the VTS. At the time, obviously it would have been manual. Little small semantic differences, but the actual handlebar shroud covering went from the lever iconic zip detail to the first ever clamshell plastic molding. There's a couple of subtle dimensional differences with the front hood and obviously the natural decal changes, which we see on all of the years throughout the 90s. But probably the biggest upgrade from an engineering point of view, as I've touched on, was that white engine block, which boasted improved cooling and reliability. And if you're looking at one of these models, if you have the opportunity between the 92 and the 91, the 92 is obviously gonna give you that trim, which helps for the porpoising issue, and it's obviously gonna have slightly better reliability. But in my opinion, and I'm a little bit biased, having a 91 XP has always been fantastically reliable, and I've also got that yellow engine block in the SP, and it's always served me well. So moving on to generation two, the biggest change to write home about is the aesthetic redesign. The top decks went from being fairly primitive and boxy, albeit still nice on the 91 and 92 XP and the SPs. In 93, everything completely changed. We saw for the first time that beautiful flowing lines hood design, which become the synonymous generation two X4 hull. Now the confusion from most is that they look at a 1993 and 94 XP and say that's an X4 hull, just because it looks so similar on the top deck. Obviously it boasts that really, really vivid green and pink detail, which I personally love that aesthetic, but it is technically running, if we're getting really nerdy now, a generation two SP hull. As I've touched on, the 93 had a green and pink colorway. Now the only difference between 93 and 94, and I might get this wrong way around, so put it in the comments if I do. Then she switched and inverted the decals from, I think it was like pink against green on one, and then vice versa on the next year. But if you look at them quickly, they almost look identical. Generation two XP featured an upgraded engine of 657, or some say 700 CC. Some people like to upplay the CCs. You'll see that throughout all of the 90s. The CCs are sometimes referred to as the 800 or the 787. So become familiar with the fact that the CCs in the way they were referred to was slightly interchangeable. And although the horsepower had increased, the top speed did still range from 45 to 47. So the performance increase, although characteristically from a riding point of view, did improve exponentially on that second gen first two year model, the actual top speed didn't massively grow. What you'll notice about the actual XPs as the years go on, they don't make such a big deal about the dual carb or twin carb, which I actually really love on the, the first gen XPs. It just becomes a standard place thing that you see in those skis. So in 94, we did actually see a 10 horsepower increase to 80 horsepower from the 70 the previous year, which is quite a good jump in all honesty. If you compare my ranting recently about the Sea-Doo Spark and the lack of horsepower increase. 
Now, interesting, something that's massively overlooked with the earlier XP, so still the Generation 1 and that 93, is sponsons weren't a commonplace thing at that point. In 94, sponsons were an optional extra, and if you had them fitted, they actually reduced the top speed. By default, they would claim that the 94 would do between 47 to 50 miles an hour, but if you added those sponsons, that actually reduced the top speed. Oh, and it's worth adding, all of these top speeds, Cedar would always make a point of saying, in idle conditions, which means when it's perfectly calm, no chopper wake. Anyone that's rode these old skis in more choppy conditions will know that the skis will have a lot of what's called ventilation, not cavitation, which is a common sort of confusion between the two. Cavitation being when the pump is actually not true and when ventilation means when the ski's actually jumping out and as you're accelerating and trying to throttle on, you actually hear the pump spinning because essentially it's got no drive in the water. Really important different characterization there. But it's really important to keep in mind though, Generation 2, 93 was the first time that we saw those really eye-catching striking curvaceous designs which become commonplace all the way through to 99 so just imagine that in 1993 the first ever top deck was introduced and that stayed albeit got rebadged all the way through to 99 so that shows you the quality of that actual product design to actually keep it for that long. So staying with generation two, some people are gonna say, Joe, it's generation three now when you move on to 95. I'm gonna call it generation two because as I've touched on the aesthetic top deck design is the same. I'll talk about the differences from an engine point of view and hull. But moving on to 95, this is when we see for the first time that iconic X4 hull, which everyone, if anyone knows anything about two strokes will say, myself now including, now I've rode one, is absolutely mind-blowing. It's so much fun. If you take the sea SP or the 1991 XP, which is quite a flat bottom hole, which doesn't particularly do well cutting through or when you're jumping waves, it's quite a flat. It's great, really fun for spinning. It was an amazing hole in terms of actual handling or cornering. Flip the script to 1995 when we saw the X4 for the first time and that ski turns on a whole nother level. You have to experience it to know what I mean, but take my word for it, guys. It is night and day different from that Generation 1 SP and Generation 2 SP hull. So although in 95 we saw the introduction of the X4 hull, aesthetically, apart from some color and graphic changes, if you were to look at the 95 XP and look at the 94 XP, they look very similar. It switched from the green, the neon green and pink, to the yellow. If you want to see what that looks like, I've got loads of videos on it because I've got the 717, which brings me nicely onto the engine that was introduced at the beginning of 1995, which was the 717cc engine with that iconic pump extension. So obviously in 1995, we saw the introduction of the X4 hull as I've touched on, but one of the other big upgrades was the 717 engine versus the smaller 657cc engine we saw in the 94. The horsepower got upgraded from 80 to 85 horsepower, and we now had an official top speed of 50 miles per hour, which I can vouch for, it definitely does that. One of the big points of contention with the 95 was a poor performance in choppy waters because the pump needed more time to fill itself, so you've got that sense of it being unhooked, as I've touched on, getting lots of ventilation. They tried to remedy that with a pump extension. As for other little details that got upgraded, as I've touched on before, they're always small little details. The actual dials went to LCD. I can't believe I'm saying LCD. Now we're in the OLED and LED world, but they got upgraded to LCD multifunction displays. Now they look super primitive now, but just try to imagine back then they would have been quite real cool details. Like now when you get a sports car or you get a high performance car and you look at the dials and it's all beautifully digital, those details back then would have been a big deal guys. The other big thing about 1995 was the introduction of DES, digitally encoded security system. Now the 717 still runs the non-DES key, but this is the technical year when we saw DES for the first time. So the next bit about 1995, which makes it particularly special is we didn't just see one XP being introduced, we saw two. We saw the first ever 787 or 800 XP being introduced specifically for SIDU to homologate to get into the race series now, for anyone that knows all of the details, bearing in mind I was born in 93, so all of this stuff I've been fortunate enough to absorb from all of my followers reading up online. Anyone that has the details that was there and has the scoop, talk to me about the obviously late introduction in 95 XP, but the big kicker to do with it is obviously the increase from 717 to the 787, the hump seat, the lack of mirrors on the hood for that aerodynamic, obviously racing stance. It still obviously runs that X4 hull, but the engine seal lots of upgrades, including the iconic now RAV valves. If you compare that to now, can you imagine Sidu introducing two Sidu Spark models in the same year? So a Sidu Spark Trix at the beginning of the year, and then an increased performance Sidu Spark Trix 
at the end of the year. God, I'd love them to do that. But that was the pace in which Sidu were innovating and bringing models out back in the 90s. One of my good followers actually explained to me the reason for this is in the 90s, everything was largely driven by the race series or the race scene. So the innovation in the skis was very much driven by what was needed inherently on the race course. Whereas if you compare that to nowadays, everything's primarily driven from a mass market point of view of how many units can be sold to a please a more casual fan, less diehard. Now I'm not saying there aren't diehard racing fans that are racing the high performance crafts nowadays, but if you compare it to people that were back there in the 90s that you talked to, it very much is more of a cult-like thing in the 90s where skis were generally crafted to be as quick as, and that is reflective with how successful the XB800 was. The XB800 is literally steeped in race history and was so successful for its time. So much so that I believe when the Parabolic V XP third generation was introduced, there was still a period where people would prefer to run X4 holes, even though comparatively, Cedar had moved on to a newer model. So in 1996, the XP800 continued. However, they took the previous year integrated mirror design because aesthetically and feature wise, it has more to offer than that hood without. So the XP in 96, some say is the most iconic, that yellow and pink beautiful design looked very similar to the 95, the late entry in 95 XP. However, it then featured a lot of the mods and cons that you got on the 717, which I have from 95. 96 was actually the last year that we saw the X4 hole in the XP format. And then in 1997, which I'll come on to in a sec, that's when we shifted to the third generation XP. But let's rewind a sec and go back to that 95 800 XP. It saw a huge increase to 110 horsepower. It used the Rav Valve 787 engine, which I spoke about, and it very much was a race machine. So as I touched on before about how Sealy would rebadge models, a good example of this is in 95, we technically see two models. We've got the 717 XP and we've got that 800. Now from a, a product line point of view or model point of view, that's too confusing. And I do agree with that. So Sealy obviously recognized in 1996, they needed to remedy that with making the XP the absolute top of the line and then tone back any models that sat below by rebadging them as the SPX. Now, if you look at my 717 XP in 95, in 96, that basically is identical, albeit it's now a full teal color. That is called the SPX, but it is 1 million percent identical. There may be some small little subtle details, again, put it in the comments, to my 717 in 95. What that then basically does is sets up perfectly the correct tiering of how you market the models. So the 800 XP, which sometimes they would call the XP Limited, which can confuse things even more. Reason being limited, as in limited production run, although I think they sold the 1996 XP in the highest quantities ever. And then the SPX would naturally sit below that, and they were cheekily just using a previous year design. One small little detail, which I absolutely love, is the SPX 717 and 96 was featured in speed cruise control, I'm probably saying that incorrectly, the double SPX setup, which comes off the back of the cruise ship and they're jumping the wake and stuff. It always annoyed me that they debadged it in that film, but I absolutely love finding old footage of these old skis. There's quite a lot of old good Baywatch footage as well, so check that as well. Features loads of blasters if you wanna see it. Going off on a tangent as always. So as we move into generation three, which starts from 1997 and runs all the way through to 2004, it was the longest XP model run, seven years in total so that outperforms the X4 and obviously the generation one and within that seven year lifespan the thing that you're going to notice is although the actual top deck and hull the actual parabolic V or some people call it the hourglass although it stayed relatively similar aesthetically a lot of details changes with the actual mechanical engineering starting in 1997 when the XP switched to the third generation Parabolic V, it essentially stole the 1996, 1995, 787 XP 800 engine and put it into that new chassis or new hull. Chassis, is that correct? And it was underpowered. That's the reality of it. So if you ask anyone that had that model, they'll say 
it was a bit of a disappointment at the time. They essentially took a great engine, but they put it into a hole, which was too heavy. As a result, the overall package felt underpowered. At that exact same time, the race series was being dominated by the X4. As a result, people were still riding the X4s, even when this new model would come in. Now, Cedar did rectify this in 1998, when they brought out the 951 or the 947. Again, different cc's and the way people refer to them. Once they introduced the 951, then the power to weight ratio was rectified. So if you're looking at the third gen XP, 1997 is typically a model that's advised that you steer away from because you will be kind of searching for more power that isn't there. Not because the 800 cc engine is not a great engine in the X4, but in that particular hull, it wasn't a great fit. Now the early years of the generation three XP were played with a number of little teething issues, most notably the water ingestion issues, which Cedo actually had to have a recall back in the day with some block off plates and stuff. I don't know the full details to this. This is one of those subject areas again, that unless you were there at the time, I don't know all of the intricacies to it, so please put in the comment. I'd love to know exactly what those issues were with those early XPs, but all that I know is the 97 was considered underpowered, and although they rectified it with a bigger engine in 98, 99, people consider the 2000 through to 2002 Carbretta 951 as the models to go for if you're looking at third generation XP. So as I've touched on throughout that seven years, quite a lot changed. And the biggest wholesale change, which divides people still to this day, is in 2003, CDU switched from the beloved Carbretta 951 through to the direct injection. Now, anyone that follows my channel will know I have a 951 2003 direct injection XPDI, God, that's a mouthful, and I absolutely love it. Why do I love it? Because I've got a 951 GSX Limited 1999, and in my personal opinion, it's just my opinion, a carburetted version of the 951 is not got as smooth a power band as the DI. That makes sense if you think about it, as in direct injection, direct fuel injection, versus a conventional carburetor, where you've got oil and fuel being mixed in a more traditional fashion. I find with the GSX, and I love the GSX by the way, I'll touch it on it in a bit more detail in a sec, that at times, you just have a tiny bit more lag in places, whereas with the DI, the power is inherently there. Now the reason the DI is hated is because a lot more electrical systems were brought in. It was a much more, let's call it picky engine to keep running correctly. But the caveat to that is if you do maintain a DI, you keep your maintenance up, you do all of the things that you should be doing with DI, like for example, keep your battery charged. One of the biggest things with an old XPDI is that it's so voltage sensitive. If you have the wrong amount of volts for cranking, it can cause literally a whole world of pain and you'll be into the maintenance light doom. You keep on top of that and you upgrade things like the rectifier to the aftermarket ones, which were much more robust. You really will have a ski in the XPDI that will be on the button. A good example of this is a carb 951, a healthy carb 951 in my opinion. Now I'm referring to stock, obviously OEM, as we all know, I love OEM. If a 951 engine had been sat, say hypothetically for three months and an XPDI had been sat for three months, both batteries on chicka charge, you pop them in and you go to fire them up, the XPDI is gonna be instantaneously on the button and I can, I can vouch for that, that is the case. And a carb, you're gonna be utilizing the more traditional choke throttle to get that engine to fire up. Not because there's anything wrong with that 951, that is the characteristic traits of a traditional carburetor setup, and that is across the board. And in my opinion, having run the XPDI, it's the closest old gen ski that has the new gen characteristics as in you go to it and it starts up. In my personal opinion, the XP is a very sensitive engine. So the way that they're being stored, a lot of people specifically in the US moan about the XPDIs and then you look at the way they're storing them and it's out on their yard. It's going really, really hot in the summer, really, really cold in the winter, and they wonder why that engine struggles. If you're winterizing your engine, you're maintaining it, you should have absolutely no issues. I know stories where people have DIs running all the way up to 200 hours without rebuilds, but that is through correct maintenance. Guys, you could have a generation one, generation two, an X4 hole, and if you abuse them and don't look after them and maintain them, it doesn't matter whether it's a DI or not, it's gonna give you issues. Okay, back to the narrative. So we saw the Carbretta version from 1997 through to 2002, 
and throughout those years the colorway predominantly stayed yellow with different accent details it was sometimes black it was sometimes silver but in 2003 they completely flipped the script and they went to that really electric red which for me again is another reason why i've always loved the di more than the yellow models so the last little bit if you've stuck around this long in the video thank you is me explaining why I think we've lost the XP and it's got put into CDU's archive and they've not reused it. I personally believe it's because the XP represents a past time which is not consistent with the direction CDU were moving in once they transitioned to four stroke in 04. In 04 we saw the RXP come in and that was the start of the, the, the sort of the next generation if you like of skis. That lightweight playful fun factor started to be lost in the actual skis and I think if you think from a marketing point of view the XP was synonymous with lightweight playful fun and also the race series and I think from 2004 onwards the industry just changed. I mean, that's a whole video in itself as to what our PWC is better now in terms of a culture than what they were then. But in essence, I think for CDU to keep reusing, like let's just say in 2014 when the Spark was introduced, would it have been more effective for them to utilize the XP? It's a risky strategy because what happens is you get all of the fans that were there and got the t-shirt in, in, in the 90s looking at that and saying, is this representative of an XP? Jet Blaster and Yamaha are suffering from this a little bit where they've utilized Jet Blaster using the word blaster. And a lot of the diehard fans are saying, it's not a blaster one, how dare you call it a blaster? So I think CDU are just trying to steer away from it altogether. I mean, you could hypothetically do the exact same thing nowadays with SPX, as in the standard non-IBR. I know they've now got IBR across the board, but imagine like the standard Spark was called the SPX, and then the Trix version was called the XP. They could have used those model tiers, but I think it, for them it just represented a fear factor as to re-earthing or digging up the past and I think CDU are always very very cautious of focusing on now and not digging in too much into their history. You can tell by their YouTube, their Instagram, their Facebook, all of their social presence that they never reference the past and I think there's two reasons for that. Number one, the past is two-stroke, which is again a topic for another day that they just almost don't want to, they want to pretend that two strokes don't exist. But number two, it's a time and a period which is so alien to now that if you expose the current day PWC riders to it, it's mind blowing. I mean, like if you were to take someone my age, because I don't fit the conventional mold. Remember guys, I was born in 1993. I missed all of this stuff. It's just the fact that I grew up and I was fortunate that my parents and my dad introduced me to skis at a young age. I've got great followers. I've started this venture and I've done so much research on it that I'm aware of it. But people comparatively my exact same age would not have a clue what an XP is or a GSX. And I actually had a bit of a back and forth on one of my comments on my uh, Spark video recently. And it was basically people saying, why are you talking about the Spark? And my sentiment to that is, is by me making Spark content and trying to dip a toe into the new gen, it actually gets a brand new audience that ordinarily wouldn't have a clue about the old stuff unless you educate them through explain, reverse engineering why the Spark is the way it is. Now, ultimately, the Spark didn't reinvent the wheel. The Spark was a foundation. I think their original promo video in 2014 was calf or something i can't remember the exact terminology but they were basically trying to bring back lightweight playful fun which was exactly the 90s so the spark didn't generate anything new it took a philosophy that they nailed in the 90s and just made it current day equivalent so the short answer is i think cdu are scared to unearth something from the past which could make people ask questions i don't think they can confidently answer as in why does a gsx why does an X4 outperform a Sea-Doo Spark with nearly 30 years removed? But all that I do know for a fact is the XP holds a special place in my heart and for many is the most iconic model name sea ever made. And the fact that it's sat there dormant, that's got to change, guys. Put in the comments if you want to see a sea XP come back. As always, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please consider hitting the subscribe button, hitting the like button. And as always, you probably guessed it by now, I've just made a probably a 30 minute video on the old stuff. Let's keep the classics alive.